बहुनाम जन्मनाम अंते ज्ञानवान माम प्रपद्यते वासुदेव सर्व स महात्मा सुदुर्लभ बहुना जन्म नमंते ज्ञानवान मां प्रपद्यते वासुदेव सर्वमिति स महात्मा सुदुर्लभ ऐसी भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी श्रील प्रभुपाद After many births and deaths he who is actually in knowledge surrenders unto me knowing me to be the cause of all causes and all that is such a great soul is very rare Shri Shri Radha Gopinath ki kindly repeat after many births and deaths he who is actually in knowledge surrenders unto me knowing me to be the cause of all causes and all that is such a great soul is very rare namo om vishnu padaya krishna prasthaya bhutale shrimate bhakti vedanta swami swami niti namine नमस्ते सरस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादे पाश्चात्य देश तारिणे जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधर श्रीवासादे गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे so in the last two wednesday days we have been discussing the four kinds of people who come to krishna and the four kinds of people who don't come to krishna so let us briefly revise what we have already discussed so who are the four kinds of people who do not come to krishna yes mudha so who is the mudha the mentality of the ass and what does he do he works hard day and night foaming at the mouth simply for sense gratification and he has no time for self realization what is the second category of people what's the meaning of naradhama the lowest among mankind and what is their particular characteristic well all four of them don't believe in god yes Yes he appears to be very cultured very polished but actually because he has no spiritual culture so although he is externally very materially advanced but because of his lack of spiritual culture he is actually amongst the most fallen of all mankind what is the third category maya ya pahrita gyana what is the meaning of that whose knowledge has been stolen by maya by illusion and who is the, what are the typical examples of my himself was not all scientists there are many scientists who are devotees even in our congregation there are many scientists but scientists who are trying to negate the existence of god who are trying to speculate mentally philosophers scientists of this sort they are all considered to be in this category what is the fourth category taha what is the meaning of that those who are envious of the lord who deny his existence outright and want to challenge god on his face these are the asuram bhavam ashritaha so these are the four kinds of people who don't come to krishna and last time we discussed the four kinds of people who come to krishna who are those four kinds arthaha those who come because they have some distress what is the second any example of that that you remember second category of people who come to krishna same order as in the verse jigyasa or inquisitive he wants to know he is curious to know what is going on like we have so many people who are passing by from this road 
and he heard the sound of some kirtan and he heard something on the microphone and he thought let's see what it's all about after all I'm free for an evening let me see and they came in just to hear and later on they went on to become devotees but they came out of curiosity inquisitiveness any examples of that Maras and third category see what is the meaning of that desire some material benefit who is desirous of something material and he approaches God for fulfillment of that material desire any example <laughs> Maharaj he wanted a kingdom greater than the kingdom of Brahma he wanted a very large kingdom Krishna fulfilled that but ultimately Guru Maharaj didn't want that he became a pure devotee simply by actually rendering devotional service last category Ani what is the meaning of Jnani? who is searching for the absolute truth he is definitely he knows that he is searching for God he may be an impersonalist he may be a personalist but all these come under the category of Jnani any example of Jnani's sages assembled at Naimisharanya when the Srimad Bhagavatam was spoken so all those sages there they were already seeking the absolute truth so these are the four categories of people now the word Sukritina and Dushkritina are used so what is the difference between these two what is Dushkritina and what is Sukritina Kritina means to perform certain activities and Dushkritina means to perform sinful activities Sukritina means one who is performing pious activities now we have already discussed some of these concepts in the earlier lessons so let us review some of them what is the meaning of being a pious person and what is the meaning of being a sinful person being the law of God how do we know what is the law of God where is it said who says it Shastra or the scripture in other words a person who is living his life in violation of the laws of God who is not living his life according to the injunctions of the scriptures he is considered to be a sinful person and a person who is living his life according to the injunctions of Shastra he is following do, doing his karma according to the scriptural injunctions he is a pious man so such pious people are called Sukritinas so the typical characteristic of a Sukritana is that he avoids sinful activity what are the four pillars of sinful activity there are sinful activities particularly in this age of Kali Yuga what are they intoxication illicit sex gambling meat eating so those who are Sukritinas they are free from these vices they are situated in the mode of goodness they are pious people sometimes of course it is very difficult to get pious people to become Krishna conscious and it is sometimes easier to get very sinful people to become Krishna conscious this is the paradox that we see but in any case Krishna is describing in that verse that these four kinds of people they come to him sometimes right and they are called Sukritana so Sukritana means a person who is avoiding all these sinful activities and somehow or the other he comes to Krishna to render some devotional service because he has some motivation of course he is not considered very intelligent at the same time Lord Krishna in the he also says that such a person is very udara udara means magnanimous udara sarva evaite he says all these four categories of people who come to me they are very udara very magnanimous in other words Lord Krishna is praising them and on the other hand we are always saying that such people are less intelligent so is there a contradiction yes Lord Krishna says such great souls in the very next verse he says the Udara are very magnanimous souls who come to me and they are not so intelligent they are magnanimous because at least they are coming to Krishna the Dushkritanas they never approach Krishna they are atheistic they never want to come near Krishna but at least the Sukritanas what for whatever reason at least if it, even if it is for some fulfillment of material desire at least they go to Krishna and therefore they have a chance that by going to Krishna tomorrow they will get purified by rendering devotional service to Krishna although it is mixed devotional service it is not pure devotional service that devotional service has some material motive behind it but nevertheless by, by virtue of the fact that they are coming to Krishna and they are remaining with Krishna there is a possibility that tomorrow they will become pure devotees when they come in contact with another pure devotee of the Lord so therefore because they are coming to Krishna they are considered Udaraha or magnanimous but the Dushkritanas they lose that chance 
and therefore they remain for a long long time in ignorance so therefore these sukritanas somehow the other they come now we see that there are some people who come but when their desire is fulfilled they go away and they become happy now i've got my desire i came to krishna for some money i asked him for money because i was in some distress i got the money now i don't need krishna now i'm living on my own abilities on my own strength so they go away then there is another kind class of sukritana who come to krishna for fulfillment of some material desires and when it is not fulfilled then they become very angry prabhupad used to quote the example very often of the second world war the the german nation was fighting the british and both were christians of course the denominations may have been different but essentially both were christians so the mothers of all the young men who went to fight in the war they were both praying to christ you please save my son and after all in the war someone has to die so some mothers found that their sons had died so they began to lose faith in god they what kind of god is this i prayed to god to save my child and he didn't so they became atheists again do you remember the story of king chitraketu and his son that we discussed couple of months back in that story we saw how king chitraketu was begging for a son and then when he got his son of course angira muni had told him that your son he will be harsha shoka the cause of your joy and also the cause of your lamentation but king chitraketu had said never mind better a disobedient son than no son at all so he had got his son and in any case to cut the long story short he had the son died and when the son died naturally king chitraketu to the extent he was happy he also became distressed when his son died and he became unconscious the queen also was in extreme misery and when she saw her husband in so much misery she became even more distressed and then at that time she began to curse the lord she became angry she was praying to the lord earlier please give me a son please give me a son and when the son came she was very happy but when the son was lost then she began cursing the lord what did she say she said that you are very cruel and you are very inexpert actually by the laws of creative power the son should never die during the lifetime of the father but therefore you have violated your own laws and therefore you are very less intelligent she is telling god she is telling krishna that actually you are very inexpert you don't know how to handle things and if fruitive activity is so powerful that it is even more powerful than birth and death then what is the need for a god that means karma itself is supreme you see there is a class of philosophers philosophers called karma mimamsa now these philosophers say that there is no need for a god the karma is supreme and everything is determined only according to karma they don't understand that there is a supreme personality who is underlying the laws of karma who is handling who is actually controlling the laws of karma when we speak of a law we also speak of a law maker if you talk about the law of karma there must be a person who is who has made these laws and who is ensuring that these laws are effective someone who is implementing the laws even on the road when you see a simple road sign no left turn or no entry you understand there is some authority behind it so when such a uh, such a fantastic law such a subtle law which operates at such uh, subtle levels of human activity how can we expect that such a law will not have a law maker so these karma mimamsa philosophers they say that karma is supreme if i perform a certain activity i must get the result and no power in this universe can stop me from getting this result if i have done that activity but they don't and they don't understand that krishna if he likes can interfere with anything at any time at his own sweet will that is the meaning of god but in any case so they say like this so this queen in her misery she was also speaking this karma mimamsa philosophy she was saying that if fruit of activity is so powerful then there is no need for god like you and if you want to cut off the relations between father and child mother and child in this way then no one in future will want to become parents then they will neglect their parent they will neglect their children so in this way she began to curse so that is also one problem with, this, with these devotees these sukritanas they are pious they come but because of ignorance or not lack of complete knowledge either they go away or when the desire is not fulfilled they become very angry 
But then those few fortunate Sukritanas who stay on, somehow or the other persevere in the devotional service of the Lord, in the contact of pure devotees, then somehow or the other, sooner or later, they will also become pure devotees. And then their life becomes perfect. So this is how gradually the Sukritanas uh, get elevated in their consciousness. So therefore, in the Srimad Bhagavatam it is said, Akama Sarva Kamova, Moksha Kama Udardi, Tivrayana Bhakti Yogena Yajeta Purusham Paraha. That whether you have material desires, Sarva Kama, Kama means material desires. Whether you are Sarva Kama, whether your mind and heart are full of material desires, or whether you are Akama, you have no material desires, or whether you are Moksha Kama, whether you simply desire liberation from this material existence, whatever be your situation, whatever be your mentality, simply worship Krishna with great enthusiasm, with great intensity. Tivrena Bhakti Yogena. Bhakti Yoga. Therefore, worship Krishna with great intensity. This is the injunction of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So, we should not think, oh, I have so many material desires in my heart, therefore, I cannot approach Krishna. No. It is because we have material desires in our heart that we have to approach Krishna. And for a pure devotee also, because he doesn't have any material desires, he still approaches Krishna. In all conditions of life, we simply approach Krishna. That is the sum and substance of spiritual life. Just keep, remain at the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. So therefore we can see that even among the Sukritanas, even among those who are devotees of the Lord, there are two kinds of devotees. One are called the Sakama devotees. Sakama devotees are these Sukritanas described in the verse that we discussed earlier, the four kinds of Sukritanas. They are also called Sakama because they approach Krishna with some material desire. And there are those who are also called Akamaha. Akama means they come to Krishna without any material motive. They want to serve Krishna simply for the sake of serving Krishna, for no other motive. This is pure devotional service, pure bhakti. The great Acharya Rupa Goswami, in whose footsteps we are following, he declares, Anyabhilashita shunyam jnana karma dinavritam anukuliena krishna anushilinam bhakti ruttama. He is defining what is pure bhakti here. He says pure bhakti means that which is anya abhilashita shunya. There must be no material desire at all in the heart. Jnana karma dinavritam. There must be no mixture of wanting to speculate mentally or no mixture of wanting to get some material benefit in return. And it must be rendered favorably, anukuliena. Anukula means very favorably rendered. Not rendered with some kind of regret, or not rendered angrily, or not rendered in envy. It must be favorably rendered, without any material motivation. So those great souls who render this kind of devotional service to the Lord, they are called akaman bhaktas, or pure devotees of the Lord. And they are also called Mahatmas. So, the subject matter of today's verse is this Mahatma. So just to recapitulate so far in what we have discussed today, there are four kinds of people who don't come to Krishna. They are the Dushkritinas. Four kinds of people who come to Krishna. They are the Sukritinas. Sukritinas are devotees. Dushkritinas are non-devotees. The Sukritinas, although they are devotees, but they are not very elevated devotees. They are called mixed devotees. Sakama devotees. And when they get elevated by coming into contact with the pure devotees of the Lord, then they will eventually become Mahatmas. So the Mahatmas of the great souls is the highest category and the Sukritanas are in the lower category. So in this way we see there are many types of worshippers of God. So this is the second category. In future classes we will discuss three other categories of worshippers of God. Now, altogether five classes of worshippers of God. Please remember this. Five classes of worshippers of God. One is the Sakama Bhaktas, the Sukritanas. We were discussing them last time, yesterday, uh, last Wednesday. Then second, the pure devotees, the Mahatmas, discussed today. And the next three categories of worshippers of God, we will discuss over the period of the next several weeks. So we can see that these Mahatmas are the great souls. Their only business in life is to serve God. They have no other work. The word Mahatma is not a rubber stamp that can be applied to any uh, political personality or any great social reformer. The word Mahatma. Mahatma means great soul. 
not a great body a great soul in other words his activity his greatness lies in his activity in relation to the soul there are many people who do great activity in relation to the body but they may be called great bodies but not great souls they cannot be called mahatmas so therefore such mahatmas have been described by lord krishna in the bhagavad gita also can anyone uh, narrate that shloka chant that shloka which in which lord krishna describes who is a mahatma anyone knows that shloka how do you define who is a mahatma here also lord krishna describes but there is another verse also yes very good mahatmanas tu maam partha daivim prakriti maashrita bhajanti ananya manaso gyatva bhuta din avyayam lord krishna says that the mahatmas are those great souls who have completely surrendered to me daivim prakritim aashrita among the dushkritanas you saw the last category of people were asurim bhavam aashrita they taken shelter of the demoniac or the atheistic uh, sentiment but these are daivim prakritim aashrita they have also taken shelter but shelter of what they have taken shelter of the lord of his divine energy so these people are called mahatmas and what is their activity how do you know who is a mahatma and who is not a mahatma do we go around wearing a label or a designation that he is a mahatma on our door do we have a designation board saying like chairman managing director mahatma how do you understand who is a mahatma the definition lord krishna says in the very next line of that same shloka he says you must be completely engaged in his devotional service you must be completely 100% 100% engaged hmm? then only can you be called a mahatma gyatva bhutadi mavyam when you know that lord krishna is this, is the supreme lord of all then you will do bhajanti ananya manaso with one pointed mind one pointed attention you will continue to serve the supreme lord this is the characteristic of a mahatma so mahatma means one who has surrendered to the lord only he can know krishna sometimes people say very casually oh yes i know god but if you know god are you surrendered to god then he says yes yes i have surrendered to god if you surrender to god are you really serving god 24 hours a day that is the meaning of serving god that's the meaning of being surrendered to god and only a surrendered soul can be a mahatma therefore lord krishna describes here that a person becomes a mahatma when he surrenders completely to the lord hmm? gyanavan maam prapadyate prapadyate means to surrender so when someone surrenders to krishna utterly he is called a mahatma and such a soul a great soul some mahatma is very rare sudurlabah very very rare to find such a soul you don't find mahatmas walking around in the street or in the bus very rare to find them hmm? one among many many thousands first of all even in endeavors for spiritual life lord krishna says so out of those thousands hardly one reaches perfection so mahatmas are very few very very rare huh? so lord krishna says that such a position is attained after many lives bahunam janmanam ante gyanavan maam prapadyate now you may say why does it take many lives why not one second perfect why not indeed that question we should ask ourselves why am i not surrendering to krishna what is the problem the problem is i don't have that faith i don't have that conviction that krishna is the supreme lord i don't have the conviction that i am actually not the lord of the soul creation i don't have the conviction that this material world is actually not meant for my enjoyment but it is meant for krishna's enjoyment i still believe that i can be happy in this world without krishna so because i don't have the proper faith therefore i am not able to surrender to krishna because i have faith in so many other things also in my abilities in my strength in this and that so many other things so if one really wants to surrender one can surrender immediately right now in the shrimad bhagavatam there is a narration of a king called king khatwang he was fighting on behalf of the demigods whenever the devatas were in trouble they would call this king khatwang he was actually an ancestor of lord ramachandra he appeared in the same dynasty before lord ramachandra so he was a great king and because the demigod was so happy with him at the end of the battle they asked him you ask us for any benediction we will give you and then he said well 
tell me how long I have to live. And they said, you have only one moment to live. So what did he do? In that one moment, he took complete shelter of the Lord, become a pure devotee. On the other hand, all of us, at least I have probably been going through many lives, many lives, bahunam janmanam ante, after many, many, many lives, still sometimes we don't surrender. We know Krishna is the Supreme Lord. We know intellectually, but still we don't want to surrender. So it's all a matter of our individual choice. The intelligent person wants to surrender immediately. To the extent we are not intelligent, we want to still hang on in our material life. So therefore, the process takes uh, a short while or a long while, depending on how sincere we are to make our life perfect. So in this way we can see it's a very rare thing. It takes a very, very long time. And after having surrendered to Krishna, then such a person becomes completely pure. And then he is no more a Sakama Bhakta. Till such time as there is even an ounce of material desire in our heart, we are said to be Sakama. When that last trace of material desire is washed away from the heart, then we can be called pure devotees of the Lord. So what is the difference between Sakama and Akama Bhaktas? Or the two categories of worshippers that we have discussed now? Yes? Number one, anyone? In the Sakam Bhakta, there is material desire, and in the Akama Bhakta, no material desires. But there is also one extra difference, which follows from the first. When the Sakam Bhaktas are in danger, or they are in some difficulty, what do they do? No, they run to the Lord. Sometimes they forget God, but sometimes, like the demigods, they are also Sakam Bhaktas. There are some devatas or demigods who are actually pure devotees, like Yamaraj, for example. But there are others who are not so pure devotees, like Indra. Sometimes Indra, you know, he has so many material desires. So the demigods, they are Sakam Bhaktas. So whenever they are in some difficulty, when the Asuras are harassing them a lot, then they run to Krishna. They run to Lord Vishnu, immediately for relief. So the demigods are intelligent, they know where to run in times of trouble. But when we are in trouble, what do we do? Doctor, lawyer, police, army, navy, so many things. We don't run to Krishna. Sakam Bhaktas are intelligent. But in times of difficulty, they go to Krishna. Please help me, please help me. But the Akama Bhaktas, the pure devotees of the Lord, even in times of great difficulty, they do not approach Krishna. Why? Now you may say, the Asuras, the demoniac people, they also don't approach Krishna when they are in difficulty. And the pure devotees also don't approach Krishna when they are in difficulty. But what's the difference? Yes? But then, why should they not, if they have faith, why don't they approach Krishna? Why don't they go to Krishna, the pure devotees? They don't have any material desires and they are not worried at all. They say, Krishna, whatever ha is happening is perfect. Krishna is looking after me anyway. Why do I need to worry? If Krishna has put me in this difficulty, He will put me out of it. And if He is not pulling me out of it, that means He wants me to be in it. If He wants me to be in it, who am I to object? Might as well be here and make Krishna happy. So He is here in this situation. Whereas the Sakam Bhakta is always worried. Why Krishna has put me in this position? Let me go to Krishna. Let him, let him solve this problem of mine. So in this way, the Sakam Bhakta is always running. The Asuras, they don't go to Krishna because they have no faith at all. So they don't even recognize the existence of Krishna. They don't recognize His power. The pure devotees, out of love, they don't want to disturb Krishna. Why should I go and disturb Krishna unnecessarily just for an insignificant soul like me? Who because I can't control my mind and senses, and because I cannot understand, I cannot surrender to Krishna, so why should I go and trouble Krishna? Of course, from Krishna's point of view, he is never troubled. Krishna wants to reach out to his devotees. But the devotee out of love doesn't want to trouble Krishna. That is bhakti. That is a sentiment of devotion. Like Sudama. Although his wife was also a great devotee. But she was telling Sudama, at least for your own sake, look, you have become so thin, at least go and beg Krishna for some food. We discussed the story of Sudama some Wednesdays back. And Sudama was thinking, why should I trouble Krishna for such a small thing, for just food for us? Anyway, he's giving us, why should I go there? In any case, just to please his wife, he went. But even when he went, all the time he was thinking, I will never ask Krishna for anything. And even when he sat there, he never asked. He came back without asking Krishna. But Krishna gave him everything. Correct? So Sudama had that mentality like a devotee. He didn't want to trouble Krishna to ask him, give me my daily bread. So therefore, this is the mentality of a pure devotee. 
just like so many other great devotees brahma in the shrimad bhagavatam there is a very wonderful prayer uh, shloka by lord brahma uh, in this connection and it goes something like this tatte nukampam susamekshamano bhunjan evatmakritam vipakam ridvagvapurbhi vidadhan namaste jivet yo mukti pade sadaya bhag in this shloka lord krishna lord brahma explains that all the difficulties that i am experiencing my lord they are only your mercy anukampa tatte anukampa i will wait for your mercy i recognize this as your mercy and whatever is happening to me now i understand that they are the results of my past karma and therefore i should simply tolerate i should simply bear with it bhunjan evatma kritam vipakam it is my activities i have committed sinful activities in the past and i am getting those reactions now so why should i trouble you because i committed some sins in the past for my fault why should i trouble you therefore i will tolerate bhunjan evatma kritam vipakam and therefore quietly tolerating my uh, the reactions of my sinful acts of the past i will what will i do will i sit quietly no hridvag vapurbhir vidadhan namaste with my heart with my speech and with my body i will continue to offer obeisances to you again and again and i will expect and wait for your mercy to come anukampa susamikshamano i know one day you will give me your mercy but i am patient i will wait this is another quality of the devotee he is surrender means willingness to wait hmm? it is most difficult to wait we want everything immediately so patience is a symptom of surrender we want to become pure devotees overnight i have been chanting for one month why am i not hairs why my hairs are not standing on end why the tears are not flowing from my eyes why my body is not trembling in ecstatic trance why krishna is not appearing in front of me but it's patience we need patience it will come if we simply follow in the meanwhile if we get some difficulty in the way we are so troubled why are all the difficulties coming upon me only after i become a devotee before i was a devotee everything was going nice of course that is also another illusion nothing is ever going nice in this material world but still we tend to think that the grass is greener on the other side oh those days were good actually don't know days were ever good but we think like that the days in the past and the days in the future we think they are good but the present day was so horrible so in this material world everything is horrible without krishna so therefore we should know that whatever is happening to us also is by the grace of krishna we should simply tolerate and therefore wait for krishna's mercy and what is the last line of the shloka jivet yo mukti padesa daya bhag and therefore lord brahma says such a person who lives like this with this consciousness what does he become he becomes a rightful claimant to liberation from this material miseries from this material existence daya bhag the word daya bhag means it is his right he becomes a rightful claimant he can demand yes now i am i, I can be liberated from this material existence so if we simply tolerate like this and accept everything and continue to discharge devotional service there are other people who say well it is also my past reaction what can i do and then they engage in all kinds of activity of self pity oh i'm so fallen and then they leave devotional service and they go away from krishna consciousness oh what can i do i am so fallen i am like this i am like that i don't have any ability to perform devotional service but no lord brahma doesn't say that lord brahma says you should consider yourself most fallen you should consider yourself all the misery is happening as a result of your past sinful activity but you should go on with your devotional service you should not stop it ridvag vapur bhir vidadhan namaste that must not stop we can see also in the lives of the great souls the mahatmas how they actually demonstrated these qualities there was there was a very great saintly personality called haridas thakur because we are dealing with lord brahma's quotation from the shrimad bhagavatam it is interesting that haridas thakur was the incarnation of brahma himself he, as you all know lord chaitanya mahaprabhu is the is lord krishna himself who appeared on this planet 500 years ago in navadvip bengal and he manifested so many wonderful pastimes here on this planet and he inaugurated the yuga dharma for this age hari naam sankirtan 
the Harinam Sankirtan is the only way in this age of getting uh, uplifted from this material miseries and to achieve pure love of God. So Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is considered the most merciful incarnation of the Lord because He is giving to us what no other incarnation has ever given pure love of God and he is distributing it very very freely without any consideration of one's qualification or one's abilities he is just giving to one and all freely so one of Lord Chaitanya's very close associates was Haridas Thakur actually in material terms Haridas Thakur was senior to Lord Chaitanya Haridas Thakur was much older than Lord Chaitanya and he appeared in a Muslim family actually and because he was chanting the name of Lord Krishna, of Lord Hari so much and with such great devotion Lord Chaitanya called him the Nam Acharya the Acharya of the Holy Name Haridas Thakur would chant almost 21 to 22 hours every day not in one week but every day he would chant 21 to 22 hours non-stop no breaks in the middle and he would not even take a sip of water or a morsel of prasad to eat till he had finished his chanting. Then he would do, in the balance two or three hours, he would do all his other activities. Eating, sleeping, bathing, everything else in the balance three hours. And twenty-two hours for chanting the holy name. Such was his devotion. Such was his exalted status. And he came from a Muslim family. Such a such an exalted position. It's unbelievable, unthinkable in this world. Of course, we cannot try to imitate Haridas Thakur. So in any case, Haridas Thakur, because he was a Muslim, born in a Muslim family, and he was chanting this Mahamantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. So both the Hindus and the Muslims were very upset. The Muslims were upset because they said, this person is an infidel. He is born a Muslim and he is chanting the Hindu names of God. Therefore, he deserves to be ostracized. He should be killed. And the Nawab of that time, he became incensed with fury. He said, this man is a disgrace to our community. He will, He is a threat to the Islamic community. Therefore, we should finish him. And the Hindus on the other hand were thinking, who is this Neksha, who is this Yavana coming and chanting the names of Krishna and he is, he is uh, completely polluting the whole atmosphere. So the Hindus were against him, the Muslims were against him, everyone was against him. But Haridas Thakur was least perturbed. For one who is engaged 24 hours in the devotional service of the Lord, all these external disturbances and the honor and dishonor given by people are of no consequence to such a person. Hmm? Tatha man apamana yoho. Beyond man apamana is least concerned. He's transcendental to all of them. So in any case, the, the Nawab, he tried to kill him. He first tried to threaten him in many ways. And when Haridas Thakur wouldn't listen, then he eventually threatened to kill him. He had him brought there. And he said, we will let you go on one condition. Then you must start chanting the name of Krishna. Otherwise we will kill you. So Haridas Thakur told the Nawab, under no condition will I stop chanting the name of Krishna. You may kill me. What to speak of killing me? You may cut my body into small pieces, this small. But each of those na each of those little pieces of my body will chant the name of Krishna. So what can you do? You can only cut up my body. But even those little pieces of flesh will chant the name of Krishna. In any case, you cannot kill me because I am the soul. So hearing this kind of talk, the Nawab was completely bewildered. Saying, how can anyone be like this? It was, it was a puzzle, a great mystery. The great devotees of the Lord are very often misunderstood. And their greatness was also not understood. So then ultimately it was decided that he would be flogged to death. He would be whipped to death. And then he was whipped in 22 marketplaces. One after the other. In one marketplace he was whipped and whipped and whipped. And taken to the next and the next and so on. Now usually what used to happen, very hefty the soldiers would come and whip so and no no person would last more than a few whips and then he would die out of sheer pain and exhaustion but the soldiers who were whipping Haridas Thakur they were amazed and astonished that they whipped and whipped and whipped not only in one marketplace second third but they went on to do it in 22 marketplaces and Haridas Thakur didn't show any sign of pain he didn't show any sign of repentance he didn't show any sign of begging for forgiveness. On the contrary, he was blissfully continuing to chant the name of Krishna 
all the time and in fact after some beatings the soldiers were getting tired they were beating with all their might and they were getting tired and then finally they pleaded with him you please die otherwise we will be in trouble because our heads will be chopped off the nawab is waiting he wants us to give the result and if we do not give him the news that you have died then we will have to die so see the quality of the great devotee the mahatma like haridas thakur what did he say did he say well you are trying to kill me better you die so you die i will not die what did he say he said okay because of my living of my being alive if it is causing you so much distress if it is going to be the cause of your death then better i die so what did he do he said release me for some time he sat down cross legged and he went into deep samadhi and in that samadhi all his life symptoms stopped and when his life symptoms stopped he appeared just like a dead body no response no breathing nothing just like the yogis sometimes they sit under the ground for months together for years together prabhupada used to say there were some yogis who can uh, suspend their bodily functions for years together and they excavate them after many years and then the yogi starts his breathing process all over again all the metabolic activities in the body are completely stopped even the doctors declare him clinically dead but after several years he comes back to life so the great devotees of the lord although they are not interested in these kind of powers but nevertheless the pure devotee uh, by the grace of krishna sometimes can get all these powers and do it at will so haridas thakur went into a deep state of samadhi constantly thinking of krishna within himself and therefore he suspended all his bodily functions so everyone thought that he had died and with great jubilation the soldiers went on to proclaim to the nawab that haridas thakur has died and everyone all the nawab and his his followers were very happy so they said now just how what can we do do you burn him or do you cremate him what do you do is he hindu or is he muslim so he said easiest way out just dump him into the river so they threw him into the ganges and they threw him in the ganges and the, he began to float down the river and then he came back to consciousness to external consciousness haridas thakur and then he came and he uh, came back to the nearing village near the banks of the river and he began his preaching once again as if nothing had happened and when nawab heard of this he was struck with wonder astonished completely that who is this haridas thakur what kind of man is this and then actually he realized what is the greatness of haridas thakur so the point of narrating the story here today is to see what is the meaning of a mahatma what is the meaning of complete surrender that he never leaves the service of krishna under any conditions he never stops chanting the holy name under any conditions shri la prabhupada has taught us to chant that's a great austerity how much trouble every day in the morning oh i have to finish so many rounds and then maybe uh, somehow the other if i'm not been able to do in the morning and i've come late in the night oh i've got eight rounds left somehow it's the big burden on our shoulders and if we are sick or oh, it's only best excuse possible beads are on one side we keep them aside and we forget them and then we think oh yes i've got a valid excuse krishna will surely excuse me this time after all how much pain i have got in my stomach i am sure he understands or so much work today i am sure he will excuse me today so we give up our devotional service but pure devotional service means ahaituki apratihita not only without any material motivation as we discussed earlier but also apratihita which means without any interruption there are no kinds of vacations or holidays from bhakti no bank holidays and no strikes and no hartals and dharnas every day is a wonderful day for krishna consciousness so haridas thakur even when he was being whipped and whipped what happened he never stopped chanting the name of krishna with the same degree of enthusiasm he was continuing to chant krishna's name that is the glorification and actually lord chaitanya later on revealed that he accepted all the blows on haridas thakur's back on his own shoulder because krishna says i protect my devotee krishna could have easily killed but uh, lord chaitanya could have easily killed but he didn't because that was not his role at that time because haridas thakur pleaded no please do not do it so therefore lord chaitanya personally bore the blows of that those whips on his own back this is the glory of lord chaitanya who is lord krishna himself so just see for a person who is a mahatma who has surrendered his everything 
how much Lord Krishna or Lord Chaitanya is willing to give back. This has been the theme of our discussion in the last several Wednesdays also, correct? The theme of reciprocation between the devotees, which is really how bhakti becomes so glorious. The Lord reciprocates in equal measure. In fact, He reciprocates even more than what the devotee can give Him. So in this way we see the glories of a great Mahatma like Haridas Thakur. Also Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ was being nailed to the cross, what was He saying? Was He condemning His people? Saying, you are all foolish people, you don't know. Actually, you are wrong. You made a mistake. It's not me, it's Him. He did it. Why don't you nail Him? Did He do that? Even we are accused of a small thing that we have done. Then we become very defensive. And we try to justify ourselves in so many different ways. Actually, I did like this and I did because of this and because of that. You don't understand me. And if someone accuses us of something we haven't done, then we raise hell. So, it's what about Jesus Christ? He just tolerated. What did He say at the time when He was on the cross? Forgive them for they do not know what they do. These are the qualities of the Mahatma. Prabhupada used to also say that Jesus Christ is a great soul. He is also a Mahatma. In this Prahlad, when Prahlad was being also tortured in so many ways by his father Hiranyakashipu, he did not even pray to the Lord for protection. Because he knew if Krishna wants to protect, he will protect. Rakhe Krishna Mare Ke, Mare Krishna Rakhe Ke. So he was not bothered. He was not concerned. He was simply thinking of Krishna all the time. So therefore, for Mahatma has to have these qualities. And this situation is obtained only after, generally speaking, after many, many, many births. Bahunam Janmanamante Gyanavan. So of the four kinds of Sukritinas, Artho, Artharthi, Jigyasu and Gyani, the Gyani is considered the best of them all by Lord Krishna in the very next verse. And he says, such a person who is actually in full knowledge of me, and who renders devotional service to me in this consciousness, in full knowledge of me, is very dear to me. And such a person, very quickly, he will become elevated to the stage of pure devotion, of pure bhakti. Anya bhilashita without any material desire. And then he will also become a Mahatma. So our goal is also to become Mahatma. Not so that people may call us Mahatma, but so that we can acquire the qualities of a Mahatma. So that we may learn to perfect our life by following the footsteps of such great Mahatmas. And then, what is the destination of such Mahatmas? At the end of this life, they are guaranteed to go back to Godhead. To go back to the kingdom of God from where we have come. This is the perfection of life. So we should know that the perfection of life lies not in achieving all kinds of material benedictions or not in going to Krishna for material comforts but actually to become pure devotees of the Lord. This is the highest, there is nothing higher in life than becoming a pure devotee of God. And one who has become a pure devotee, nothing more is left for him to achieve in life. But does it mean he stops his activity at that time? He goes on. He just goes on and on and on and on eternally. In fact, it is when he becomes a pure devotee that his real business begins. Then he goes on serving and his, the, the discharge of devotional service becomes actually sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. The real bliss of bhakti is experienced only beyond the stage. What we are now experiencing in our neophyte condition is only sometimes a small taste. Krishna sometimes gives us a very small taste of that high bliss, that ecstasy. Sometimes. Just to keep us here. Just to keep us at his lotus feet somehow or the other. But we must be careful that we must continue. If we continue at the lotus feet of the Lord, serving him, then one day we will be successful. We must have that faith. Just as when a, a person who has come in from the scorching sun, he comes under the shade of a tree, he gets immediate relief. Although the sun is there outside and he may still be perspiring, but immediately there is some relief. And eventually he will become completely rested, to be sure. If he goes out into the sun again, there will be trouble again. But if he simply remains where he is, he is be relieved. Similarly, having come to Krishna, the scorching heat of material distress in the outside world is very painful. So if now that you have come to the shelter of Lord of Sri Sri Radha Gopinath, you should just stay here. Just stay on, somehow or the other, in spite of so many difficulties that may come, in spite of so many troubles. Just continue to discharge devotional service. And already you will experience some relief. And if you don't go back into the sunshine, the scorching heat, then eventually, very shortly, we can all attain the perfection of life. Thank you very much. So we will have darshan now.
and uh, after the dash so are there any questions at first uh, in a way that uh, uh, he wants to have uh, some more money or you maybe he wants to have some uh, uh, a bigger house or a, a car in order to come to the temple what are such material desire if something is going to help you to come to krishna if something is connected to krishna then in one sense it is not a material desire because ultimately you want to progress in your krishna consciousness but on the other hand there is also a danger that because of these acquired possessions we may get entangled and we may get attached to them and we may also begin to use them for things other than krishna consciousness so whatever is needful whatever is necessary for improving our spiritual life we should do whatever practical action is necessary in whatever practical day to day adjustments you need to make in your material life you can make but with the ultimate goal of ensuring that it helps you to remember krishna more and to become a better devotee if you do that then such plans and such desires are legitimate but we must not be attached to such plans it doesn't mean that if i don't get a car to come to the temple then i will reduce my krishna consciousness on that must go on what is the test that whether this is really material or not that if krishna doesn't give it to me i am still continuing krishna consciousness with the same enthusiasm that is the test or if you have something and krishna takes it away from you the proof that you are detached is that you are still continuing in your krishna consciousness with the same enthusiasm perhaps more so we should go about these things in a detached way as far as our material things are concerned then it can be said to be done in krishna consciousness otherwise it can be just a disguised material desire is there any other question a word has come sudurlabh is there any difference between durlabh or sudurlabh is, is it only emphasis emphasis durlabh means rare sudurlabh means very rare so rare to find sin is not obeying the laws of god the laws of god are given in the scriptures now when we come to hear bhagavad gita or shrimad bhagavatam then we are told about the four regulative principles and we are men- we are uh, taught that uh, we must not eat meat that is meat eating is a sin but then the quran and such other scriptures are also the words of god now in such other uh, scriptures there is no such injunction and the people who follow the different faiths uh, they feel they commit no sin when they have meat of mother thing so there is a kind of a contradiction and especially in a place like bombay or any other place for that matter where people live in a cosmopolitan environment these kind of clashes of ideas do take place then how is the dispute to be resolved or what is the right way out actually anyone with some clear intelligence will easily understand that killing of animals is a very cruel activity what to speak of talking of elevated subject matters of god and scriptures why should you cause which which god or which religion will want us to cause unnecessary pain to others civilized life means to cause minimum pain to others for your survival in the very act of surviving we are definitely going to cause pain to others no doubt about it that is the way the material world is designed try hard as you might you are not going to be able to not cause pain to others even unknowingly you will step on an ant you are breathing so many germs and killing them you have to eat plants even if you are a vegetarian the principle is minimum possible violence for your own survival minimum to the max minimum uh, minimum violence so why should you cause pain and cruelty to others unnecessarily this is the first principle and when we get more advanced we can understand things like law of karma action reaction of how much when we act on others it will come back to us so first of all we we can understand it from a philosophical point of view of why we are saying what we are saying why these four are considered to be sinful activities from the spiritual point of view now the scriptures are given for all kinds of people in all lands in all times in all circumstances therefore we have variety of scriptures as we were discussing when we discuss we had two lectures on shastra scriptures maybe a month back or so so we were discussing at that time how scripture is one originally 
but it is subdivided into various sections and it appears to be separate shrutayo vibhinna it appears to be subdivided into so many different sections that are apparently contradictory why so because people's mentalities are conflicting there are some people who are very sinful some people who are not so sinful some people who are a little pious and some people who are beyond piety and impiety they want only pure devotion so for every class of people krishna is giving us a certain kind of scripture and not only for mentality but also for time and place and circumstance so when the quran and bible were given the circumstances were different they were in the desert and they were in certain social economic situations and prof and the will of god at that time was at least to get them to stop certain sinful activity there are so many severe injunctions in the quran if you read you will be shocked as to what kind of what was the need for prophet muhammad to say so many things like this obviously they were doing all those activities at that time therefore prophet muhammad had to say don't do these things otherwise what is the need for him to say it in other words he was talking to people of that class at that time they were savages in the desert at that time there are many who consider them savages even now in the arab arabian countries but at that time they were absolute savages so for such people you cannot talk about high philosophy you cannot talk about upanishads and bhagavatam philosophy you have to give them what they can understand so we can understand in the same way just like a phd mathematics teacher when he is teaching the second standard he teaches at a certain level when he teaches 10th standard he teaches a certain level when he is teaching bsc at a certain level and when he is guiding some phd research scholars in mathematics he will teach at another level same mathematics the same truth 2 plus 2 or equal to 4 but he will teach in different ways according to the level or the capacity of the people to understand similarly the various scriptures are meant for various mentalities and of people in different times in different circumstances situations and so there appears to be a contradiction so we can see which is the highest what is the highest if i am willing to be satisfied with the lower grade then all right but that will not help me to achieve the highest perfection of life in and of itself it will help me to become slightly elevated in consciousness but even then even if they are eating meat according to the particular actually even in the quran it is very clear that even in the when you eat meat the name of allah has to be inscribed on it so in other words they are also talking about the process of offering of prasad even in the bible it is said thou shalt not kill but they extend it to say thou shalt not kill man they say you can kill animals but christ never said that you can kill animals he said thou shalt not kill so therefore because they are not following the injunctions of their own scriptures therefore there is problem at least if they start following their own injunctions properly then at least they will get some gradual advancement and in future life they will be able to understand bhagavad philosophy the bhagavad philosophy is meant for the paramhansas and for those who are aspiring to be paramhansas it is meant for everyone at the same time it is not meant for everyone it is meant for everyone in the sense that anyone can come to it no restrictions of caste creed nationality etc at the same time everyone cannot come to it because they are conditioned by certain mentalities and they will not come to this if it, for example when prabhupad went to the west one of his god brothers went to the west and one great lord british lord some esquire so and so he asked him what is your sanatan dharma what what can you do to make me a brahmin can i become a brahmin so he said yes so what do i have to do so he said no meat eating no illicit sex no intoxication no gambling is impossible not possible so such people how can they come to understand bhagavatam not possible so for each class of people there is another particular kind of scripture that is the reason why there appears to be so many contradictions but actually it is not therefore we should try to get as many people as possible to try to understand this bhagavad gita and bhagavad philosophy then they can go to the highest state one last question if there is anyone